Good afternoon. Welcome to the show. I'm Jim Fleisig. During today's show, we will discuss critical issues facing government and industry leaders in securing cyberspace. With me on the show today are Major General Joseph Brendler, the Director of Plans and Policy, J5 U.S. Cyber Command, Ron Puntius, the Deputy to Commanding General, U.S. Army Cyber Command and Second Army, Jeff Eisensmith, the Chief Information Security Officer, the Department of Homeland Security, Rick Howard, the Chief Security Officer, Palo Alto Networks, David O'Berry, the Worldwide Strategic Technology <coughs> Office of the CTO, Intel Security, and Chris Steele, the Chief Solutions Architect, Software AG Government Solutions. Let's get into the discussion here. Let's start with Major General Joseph Brendler. Uh, can you tell us, uh, give us some examples of areas where you're seeing progress being made in uh, securing cyber in cybersecurity? Yes, Jim. Thanks. Uh, sure, and and uh, thanks for having us on your show. Great. Uh, thanks for coming. I'm glad to be here. I would have to say, in terms of. Uh, uh, cybersecurity, we've made significant advances in the areas of the construction of the force, the workforce we call the cyber mission force. Mm -hmm. uh, the adoption of advanced technologies and the implementation of what we're referring to as a joint information environment. And the single security architecture for the joint forces that's mm -hmm. part of that. Uh, and uh, significant advances in our partnerships, both international and interagency within the federal government. And we're starting to have more improvement in our public-private partnerships as well. Oh, terrific. terrific. I know how comp I, I think it's many don't understand just how complex the subject is and how difficult and how, how hard it is to stay out there in front of the curve. Uh, Jeff Eisensmith <coughs> over at DHS. Uh, obviously, DHS is right in the middle of all this stuff, too. Can you give us some ideas of some areas where you see progress being made, Jeff? Uh, so I would say probably one of the largest areas will be ongoing authorization. So, so we're moving away from the old style of um, here's a three-ring binder, here's a checklist, let's go down that checklist. And you don't really have a lot of latitude to really make decisions on how to best manage risk. Right. In, in the ongoing authorization piece, which is now in legislation and is now also in, in the OMB management memo, mm -hmm. uh, I think it's 1403, it, this actually gives the mission owners the ability to say, I'm going to focus on these things and defocus on these things. Okay. It's an event-driven paradigm. Mm -hmm. And so that's probably the most exciting thing we have going on right now. Uh, and when you integrate that with things like CDM mm -hmm. um, and the workforce being updated, that's, that's really big for us. Yeah, I think it sounds to me like a prioritization process rather than just the old checklist of let's really focus on what are the real issues, prioritize them, address them, get yes. them one by one. I like that. Uh, <coughs> Rick Howard over at uh, Palo Alto Networks. What, uh, where do you see progress being made in supporting your customer base in this area? I think one of the biggest advances we've seen in the last 15 years is the uh, willingness of everybody to share threat intelligence information with each other. That idea started back in the 90, late 90s when the ISACs got formed. Uh, and everybody's realized that it's something we should do, but it's been very hard politically, uh, uh, internally, and externally to get that kind of thing done. Uh, advanced organizations have been doing it well. They're, the FSISAC is probably the premier information mm -hmm. sharing organization. But in the government space, uh, the defense industrial base has been doing that very well for at least five or six years. I think we've hit a tipping point, though, okay, and the industry is ready to share uh, between both commercial and uh, government space. Uh, I know President Obama is going to be talking about that next week as one of his initiatives, mm -hmm. all right, but I think the industry is ready to go. Share threat information not only between government and commercial, but even commercial operations, uh, even with our own competitors. So yeah, I'm, that's looking good. Yeah, actually, the ec excellent points. And I think world events are just making uh, it all that more evident. While share, why sharing information is that is that important? Right. I mean, there's just so many things going on now uh, around the world. Ron Pontius um, <coughs> over at. Um, the second uh, U.S. Army Cyber Command. What are some of the areas where you're seeing progress being made in uh, securing cyberspace? Yes, and, and thank you for being here today. The the it really is a, the leadership of the Army has really focused. Uh, cyber is a high priority area, and it really has focused on people. And there's a tremendous amount of initiatives now focused on that. Mm -hmm. The Army recently uh, has approved the new a new branch uh, for the U.S. Army, and that's the first branch in over 25 years. It's a cyber branch, 
and so that's there. The addition, we've stood up a cyber center of excellence at Fort Gordon, Georgia, which is to work on the requirements and the doctrine of what it means to have cyberspace operations in the Army. Mm -hmm. Additionally, as Gen General Brenler referred to, the Army is making its contributions to the cyber mission forces. We're working our way through standing up. Uh, we've recently stood up a cyber protection brigade uh, that's really working on defensive cyberspace operations. And additionally, uh, we've also stood up the Army Cyber Institute up at the U.S. Military Academy at West Point, which is really about uh, working the partnership with industry, academia, and, and kind of the thought about where cyberspace operations should be and what it not only means to the DOD, but really to the nation. Yeah, wow. It sounds like a lot of activity. And uh, clearly, it's cybersecurity has made it to the front burner. I mean, we have the president talking about it in State of the Union addresses. We have uh, places where the Congress is actually saying uh, if there's places where we can work with the administration, cybersecurity is one that uh, we actually believe we can uh, get, make some progress. So I, I think it's out there in the front burner, you know, uh, in terms of uh, being a national priority. Uh, Chris Steele over at Software AG, where are you seeing progress made in working with your, uh, your customers? Well, I think, you know, building on what you said, Jim, um, just all this negative publicity we've seen in the media over the last couple of years with mm -hmm. these high-profile commercial targets is really sort of driving cybersecurity awareness across the agencies. And what we've seen is that it's starting to move up the stack. So whereas in the past we had groups that focused mainly on perimeter security, uh, securing the infrastructure. Now we see it moving up into the application space. So mm -hmm. we see applications being driven with security uh, baked in. Uh, there's a lot more awareness at the developer level of security, secure protocols, and um, really ensuring that at the application layer, you know, we're as secure right. as we are at the perimeter. Absolutely. I think, you know, in, you know, years back, everybody thought about securing that perimeter, you know, securing the network. But then the realization that there's an awful lot of data and application inside that network, you know, it's already there. And then we have all, all the devices that are in the network that also need protection. So it becomes a far more complex set of issues than just the perimeter. Can I jump in there? Sure. This is one of my pet peeves. I'm an old computer science guy, right? Uh-huh. Well, I think we discovered buffer overflow, okay, in the 1960s. Or right. Since then, we put a man on the moon, and we haven't stopped buffer overflow. <laughs> and the fact that since we're, uh, that it's getting in the application space, it's the best way to do Yeah, I, I think I wrote some of those programs that blew up from that buffer overflow. There's no COBOL programs. Uh, uh, you on the moon, too? Uh, no, I, not, I, I, I can't take any credit for that one. David O'Berry uh, over at Intel Security. Sure. Where do you see progress being made, so, Dave? I think uh, to riff off of some of that, first of all, um, I was at uh, DHS's SBIR program, uh, the <coughs> cybersecurity program for your incubator <coughs> aspect a couple weeks ago. Um, fantastic stuff out of there. Um, and uh, I think what, what we're seeing, if 2014 was the, the year of the threat information, uh, just the flows and the information right. exchanges and stuff like that, we're starting to see enablement of that. So our, our concentration is, again, that there is no perimeter anymore. I'm not sure that there ever has been a That's perimeter. That's a good point. That's a very good point. Yeah, I think I think the reason that we've it's, we thought about the perimeter is because it's kind of easy to focus on this, right? But in a, in a completely ubiquitous computing world, right. with the Internet of Things and everything else, whatever you want to call it, um, you no longer have a, it's not even a remote perimeter. So the information where you get it in, in this endpoints and flow points model, there's a great deal of information that exists at the edge that you have to correlate with the network stuff. Right. So enablement of that um, in a standard, like DXL is an a Internet of Things standard, to be able to enable all of these threat information exchanges to happen in real time. <coughs> because you can be, you know, you can consume these feeds all day long, but if you can't actually take action, like in CDM, you know, I would say uh, continuous data monitoring and remediation aspects, mm -hmm. right? Being able to actually incorporate SDN as you go forward um, in, in the near future right. to be able to make changes to your network to be more more secure and more you know and more resilient to the things that are coming. Yeah, actionable. Taking being That's able it. to actually so I, you know I don't say identify best, and take take an action to to. Uh, uh, I don't say best practices. I say best actionable practices. Yeah, so how point. much rubber to the road can you get? Right, right. Very good, uh, Jeff Eisensmith. If I ask you first to point to a specific program that you think is really making a difference. Um, can you pick one out that you think is uh, really going to make a difference in security? So I would say uh, continuous diagnostics and mitigation. Mm -hmm. um, for years and years and years, um, the government has always been out there trying to procure and deploy security on its own. Mm -hmm. uh, and, yeah. and what I'd like to say is 
Uh, we were like lone zebras out on the Serengeti. Okay. Right? There are no good outcomes for lone zebras right. on the Seren <laughs> Serengeti. Very good point. Like so, so CDM was an opportunity. <clears throat> Congress funded it. The White House is fully supportive. It was, uh, this is the opportunity for us to really say at the enterprise level, how do we get the proper tools in place? Uh, the idea that we can actually bring in services, manage services to get an enterprise look. DHS in particular <coughs> was set up in 2002. Right. Incredibly diverse mission. We have we have things like Secret Service, we have Coast Guard, we have FEMA. Right. All yada, with yada, different yada. security requirements. And all different security products. Mm -hmm. So CDM for me was an epiphany. I have the opportunity, a once in a lifetime chance, to take an incredibly heterogeneous environment and get to homogeneity, and that's huge for me. Absolutely, absolutely. It's a big challenge, but it's a big opportunity. Yeah. Uh, Ron Pontius, how about uh, over at the uh, U.S. Army? If I asked you to point at a specific program that you think is really going to make a difference. And it really is. Uh, the Army is a key player, but it's really a larger DOD, and that's the uh, movement to a single joint network, which when you think about the DOD, um, you know, you have thousands of networks currently. But really with that is the, as General Brendler mentioned, about moving to a single security architecture. The Army and the larger DOD has made some tremendous investments in, in the joint regional security stacks. Mm -hmm. And as we're moving to that, to have, have the single security posture across the entire DOD network. And we're, we're well on our way. That's a, a somewhat of a journey. Uh, we're about two years in, be about two more years to work through it. But that is, that's, that I think is well in our way. Yes. Well on the way and uh, no turning back now. General right. Rendler, um, can you add to that or per perhaps identify a program that you believe is going to make a big difference in uh, the cybersecurity world? I, uh, rather than adding, would reinforce what Ron's already said. Okay. The joint information environment that I referred to <clears throat> right. earlier is the joint capability that he's describing. For us, this is important because the, um, the military that we've built for America, which is highly technical, is intended to function as an <clears throat> advantage for us over potential adversaries. The fact that we can leverage our advancements in technology is supposed to be an advantage mm -hmm. over adversaries. Sure. But the fact that uh, we now have come to depend on those technologies presents potential adversaries with the possibility that they can use that as an opportunity to turn what was intended to be our advantage into, into our liability, yeah. which is, uh, uh, I think it was General Shali Kashvili who used to say, use creates dependence, dependence creates vulnerability. Oh, I like that. So whatever we can do to improve our standards for security across all of the joint force improves America's ability to count on its military and its use of technology to be able to function as an advantage for the military. Well, that's excellent. That's excellent said. Yeah, and you can understand that once you view that you have an advantage, it becomes a target for the adversaries to try to offset that advantage. So we got to stay one step ahead all the time. <coughs> David O'Berry, um, what do you think? If I asked you to point at a specific program that you think's making a big difference, what, what would you say? Um, I think overall, if you look at what they're talking about here, is um, is actually the recognition that standardization of what you're doing. Um, as far as processes go, that not everybody is their own special snowflake. Um, and, you know, no matter how much they want to be, there's 90 percent of this mm -hmm. that can be really standardized to a way that, you know, that 10 percent or 5 percent, that's the really hard stuff, you can mm -hmm. actually expend your efforts on that. So I think the information sharing in general, um, in an automated fashion, has actually probably brought to light more of where can we standardize these things. Um, I always say that standardization uh, breeds commoditization, commoditization breeds ubiquity. And, you know, you, you, when you think about a ubiquitous network, it has to be standardized and then commoditized. And I know maybe many in the security industry, you know, don't want to think about that. But the reality is, is that, you know, the more, you know, commodity we can make these things, the more, you know, almost like a utility that's kind of where Intel is very interested in being yeah. as low in the stack as we can <coughs> to give you the best platform to work off of. And then you take your business, what your strategic planning is for your business, and put it on top of that. Mm -hmm. And so with that secure foundation, I think that 
going forward is going to be the information sharing is going to, is going to be where it's at and where it, where it has to be, I think. As if, if you don't want to, like sure. to jump on Absolutely. that for just a second, because it represents a point of sensitivity for me. Uh, I, I don't believe in absolutes, and I don't want to dispute what David has just said mm -hmm. or, or what Jeff said earlier right. about the value in ubiquity, which can easily come from standardization mm -hmm. and homogeneity. But on the other hand, homogeneity is in itself uh, fundamentally a shift toward the end of the spectrum, which represents all your eggs in one basket, right. which presents a vulnerability in, in and of itself. Sure. So you, you have to standardize mm -hmm. the appropriate degree of diversity from which you get the added protection of not everything being compromised when one piece of it is compromised. And I, I, I want to do say absolutely. I don't know the prescriptive all the time is what I'm saying when I mean standardization. But the way data is actually changed, exchanged in a secure fashion is very important from that perspective. I also think that when you talk about you know what your attack surface is, what someone can hit. Um, standardization can lower that attack surface, but at the same time, you have to make sure that you don't have the same mechanisms protecting you at multiple layers. Mm -hmm. You know, for instance, you know, all antiviral type products or all network-based products don't necessarily protect the same way, even if they're within the same company. So I think that that, that type of mixture, you're absolutely right. Well, the, the joint information environment that Ron and I have both commented on already is largely about consolidation, the efficiency that comes from right. that, the advancements in effectiveness that are derived from that, right. and also, the improved security that comes from operating a more consolidated architecture, in other words, less <coughs> sure. to a higher standard. Right. So and yeah. I think the heterogeneity aspect of that is very interesting because once you do standardize the things that are, are what I would consider just block and tackle, mm -hmm. then that gives you the ability to kind of riff off of that to be able to, I think the community can develop their own widgets to actually plug into that. So go ahead, sir. Yeah, Jeff. So I think, all right, so, so when we talk about the hom homogeneity, what we're talking about, at least, at least what I was saying was, while I, while I don't want to have 15 tool sets doing the same exact facet of security, you're still going to have incredible defense and depth. Yes. Sure. Right. right. And so, but, but what I will say is, if you have 10 sysadmins and all you're doing is Windows 7, you can have three craftsmen, you know, three journeymen, and the rest are just newbies. Right. Right, but once you have like seven and Vista and Windows 8 and seven flavors of Unix, how many craftsmen do you have? Yeah, right. None. Right. Because everyone's playing whack-a-mole. Yeah, right. Right, so it's, it's really key to get that, how, how much, you know, so, to get Some degree of, it almost sounds like the arguments we have with, with cloud and things like that. What can go to the cloud? What can go commercial? And you, you wind up with a hybrid. Certain things can, certain things can't, certain things won't. Um, <laughs> Rick Howard, what do you think if I asked you for a specific program that you'd point to that you think's making a big difference? Well, I've been going around the world talking to lots of different kinds of security people in this last year, and uh, and we're and we're very happy to be part of this joint stack security environment uh, uh, to help the uh, folks do that. Right. But what we've seen, all right, is people are refocusing their efforts. Everybody's been trying to do advanced threat intelligence, and we've kind of got lost sight of basic blocking and tackling, like yes, David was saying, right? That they pay a lot, that uh, my customers have paid a lot of money to put in new uh, technology, but then didn't spend the time or the resources to make sure that it was configured correctly right. to do the things you wanted to do when you bought it in the first place. Right. So that is, I, that's, that's a new thing that people are coming back to. That threat prevention is imp as important as anything else you're going to do in the security Yeah, side. you can't yeah. just buy it and plug it in and exactly. say, okay, we're done now. Yeah, you have all to. the vitamins in the world, but if you don't wash your hands, you're yeah. probably not going to exactly. do well. Yeah, very good point. Good analogy. Uh, Chris Steele, what do you think? What's a specific program you'd look at that you think is uh, making a difference here in improving cybersecurity? Well, I agree with what Ron said. Um, and to build on what everybody else has been talking about, I think that, you know, it's great that we do have um, this effort towards, you know, homogenizing the, the bottom of the stack and building up. As we get up into the application layer, you know, we're always going to have very, you know, large differences, a lot of heterogeneity in terms of what the applications themselves look like. What we can standardize on is the approach to security and developing uh, secure patterns of application development. So understanding what are the, the different key risks, what are my attack surfaces, sure. and what are the best patterns to secure those. So really um, 
you know, as an integration company, we look at bringing together a lot of different applications, integrating data across mm -hmm. these different silos, <laughs> but approaching security in a uniform fashion. So yeah. I think once we get there at the application layer where we have uh, just ingrained sense of, of security and we're able to reuse all these different patterns will solve a lot of problems just at the application layer itself. Yeah. I'm hearing today focusing on application and data versus just the perimeter. Ron, you had a comment? That's what I was going to add to. Uh, don't want to have people just think this is purely what the discussion was about networks. Right. Data is absolutely, absolutely. incredibly important because that really is what the crown jewel is. Absolutely. It's about the data, and there's a recognition the work going on that you can't just assume that the, if I secure the network, I'm securing the data. Right. Absolutely. Right. And I think you, you're going to see that more in mobile. I mean, who cares about the device? It's the, the data that's on the device is what we care about. And, and we've always talked <clears> about <throat> data classification, which has kind of proved very hard at times, right? But actually, the, the magic to me, um, and, and, and when you look at it, is where does the application classification, data classification, and user classification come together. So that can, that's really important because uh, what well, you said, there's no perimeter anymore. Okay? Right. But yeah. It's about islands of data wherever it's it is. Triangulate them. Yeah. And we've come to the point in, the, in our technology field where we can secure different islands of data differently based on how important it yep. is. We can do that. Excellent. For Excellent. me, the end-to-end uh, -end perspective on this is the recognition that it's beyond the data, it's the missions dependent on the data that we're that's actually trying to assure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Good points, guys. We're on a roll here, but <laughs> I, I want to talk a little bit more about lessons and priorities, but first we need to take a short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. Welcome back to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. I'm Jim Fleisick here with General Brendler from U.S. Cyber Command, Ron Pontius from the U.S. Army Cyber Command, Jeff Eisensmith from Homeland Security, Rick Howard from Palo Alto Networks, David O'Berry from Intel Security, Chris Steele from Software AG Government Solutions. We're talking cybersecurity. We've talked about progress and specific programs. <coughs> Let's talk about some of the lessons we're learning along the way. We found out from the show that a lot of our listeners and a lot of uh, your colleagues around like to hear from uh, your experiences things that may help them, you know, lessons learned or things that you've encountered. Start with uh, Ron Pontius over the U.S. Army. Ron, what are some of the lessons you're learning as you're, as you're trying to address these tough areas? So I would highlight three. <coughs> First, cybersecurity is really a national security issue, and it really is taking the whole of government in partnership with industry, academia, uh, to really address this. The second is a recognition that this is a absolutely dynamic space, and we must be adaptive in learning in addressing it. So it, it can't be the traditional sort of, of government bureaucracy, we must have that adaptability, flexibility, agility. And third, uh, highlighting something I said earlier, is it really is about the people. We must have, must be able to recruit and retain the very best professionals to work this in this adaptive, changing, dynamic environment. Yeah, excellent points. I agree with you, too. I mean, there's no complacency here. I mean, the bad guys aren't going to sit back. They're going to constantly be trying to find uh, the weakest link in, uh, in a way to penetrate uh, into our systems. Um, uh, General Brendler, what do you think are some of the lessons you're learning, some of the things you might want to pass on here? Well, I think one of them is that uh, it's not just about the application of technology and the construction of the workforce to manage the technology, but the actual recognition of human factors in the larger context. Uh, the what is it we're using this for and the recognition of the value that that per is, has to us. Uh, in the reciprocal, then, the value associated with things that can help us prevent our loss associated with that not going right. So a cybersecurity problem actually can translate into real financial loss. Yeah. Uh, and for us, that's not just financial, that's mission, that's people's lives. Yeah, yeah you know, I actually <clears throat> have had discussions on this that it's, it actually resonates better with senior leadership and board, especially in the private sector, to talk about the risk to the organization as opposed to cybersecurity as a subject. I mean, you're talking about your entire reputation of your organization. I mean, we look, look at some of the attacks we've seen already and what they've done to damage some of the, the, the brands of some of these companies. Uh, Jeff, what do you think? What's uh, some lessons learned along the way here? Let me take a very different tact here. Okay. Uh, one of the things that we've really uh, discovered is that uh, uh, we have let contracts that go out for five, six, seven years. Mm. And uh, the contract language at the time it was written really didn't cover 
things like cyber contingencies. Mm -hmm. if, there, if there's an incident, how do you handle, <coughs> handle data? And so there's been a grassroots effort between OMB, DHS, and a lot of other agencies and departments to craft a new cyber language that's going to have everything we need to give us the responses that are, re that, that are required. For instance, um, it can't be squishy when you're going to sever a relationship with one of your partners. And this goes in the corporate world as well. Mm -hmm. If something occurs and you pull that plug, it may be the smart thing to do from a security perspective, but disastrous from a, from a contract liability perspective. Mm, interesting. Interesting. Something I haven't thought about. <clears throat> uh, Rick Howard, what do you think? What are some of the lessons we're learning along the way here as we uh, as time goes on? Well, I think uh, as uh, people I've talked to over in the last year, uh, we're transforming our old incident response teams into intelligence teams. It doesn't mean incident response is going away. It just means we're kind of raising their level a little bit, right? Because we were talking about context of the attacks. I mean, I started doing this back in the day. Incident response teams would play whack-a-mole with the bad guy. Something bad would happen. You run over, take it offline, fix it, and then you wait for the next thing to happen. But you have no understanding of what the adversary was doing or who it was or what he was trying to accomplish. So what advanced organizations I've seen are you know, using intelligence teams to put that context onto the adversary. So we're not just putting band-aids on the things as we fast problems occur. We're trying to get out in front and, and, and have the intelligence in place to prevent things from happening in the first place. Because of that risk statement you were talking about before, which, right. by the way, um, we're horrible at, okay, because security people have come up through the technical ranks mostly and don't really understand uh, risk to the business or to the organization. Yeah, I mean, that's a whole other conversation yeah. of how you have that conversation. Because let's face it, uh, boards of directors are concerned with their yeah. stock prices and stockholders' <laughs> equity, reducing costs, generating yeah. revenue. When you talk about security, it's like, well, that costs money. How does that contribute to that uh, those goals? So you, you really, really got to talk risk and talk about yeah. trusted organizations yeah. and so forth. Right, the uh, board doesn't really care that you bring up a spreadsheet of the 3,000 vulnerabilities you found in the last scan. Right. Okay, it doesn't right. really care about that's that. Right. Right. Or, yeah. Yeah, show them some. <laughs> yeah. uh, Chris Steele, what are some of the lessons you're learning along the way here? I think the biggest lesson that we're learning is you really need to uh, bake security in from the start. And what we've seen is if you look at your network architecture, application architecture, data architects, our network architects really do that. So when they start out, when they start building that network, they're thinking security first and foremost. Unfortunately, it's been the case that application architects, data architects, they're not really doing that. And what we've seen time and time again is where the vulnerabilities occur is where we try to retrofit security in at the end. We've gone ahead, we've designed the application, we've built it, now we sit there and try to secure it. And yeah, the, these bolt-on um, solutions just never work. That's where we have all the problems. So really, I think a lot of it is education, and as we said before, bringing in the right people, having the security architects working side by side with the application architects and the data architects to really ensure a holistic approach to security that we do bake it in from the beginning. Yeah, sure. great, great point. I mean, how we hear over and over and over again just how much more costly it is to try to retrofit security after the fact as opposed to building it in right up front. Uh, David O'Berry, what are some of the lessons learned along the way? So I think a lot so, such great points. Um, one is that uh, talking about the, the tip of the spear <coughs> aspect, right? Everything we do, whether you're a graphics design company or the army is about enablement of tip of the spear in a safe and secure manner, right? So if it doesn't flow from your strategic planning process in general, if your security operations don't somehow, then what are you doing them for, right? right? Um, and I think, you know, a colleague of mine, Kevin Reardon, has been saying this for a number of years, um, that the value strategy of that aspect is that here's how we enable the edge of our environment to do what it needs to do, the producers. Um, and another aspect, and what I'm hearing often, and, and it's, it, I'm a huge believer in OODA loops, uh, Boyd's loops, you know, basically these iterative uh, loops of information that you reorient on. And the military does this incredibly well on the battlefield. And I'm, I assume, if, as in, you know, they, they also bring it into their cyber aspect to, you know, to be able to observe and orient and deploy and then, and then basically just continue these, these eddies uh, that allow them to completely change course 
uh, in, in a matter of minutes and seconds, and now in cyber world in milliseconds at times. So I think that iterative aspect cannot be overstated. These three-year, four-year, five-year contracts that don't have iterations in them, that have language that are potentially, you know, really can, can hold you down. I think that, <coughs> that, that change has been very positive as well. Yeah, I've said it before in the show, we're, we're beginning to live in a world where time's approaching zero in terms of decision making, because, I mean, things happen like that. So, yeah. uh, one more thing, real quick, and I would say also that when you think about this, we're talking about the incident response teams, his point was so valid. Um, you know, if, if, it's, if it's incident response, that's, that's the CSI team from television. You right. know, once those guys are on site and somebody's had a really bad day, okay, and it's not going to get better, for that guy at least, right? right? And you can say, well, how, what, you can say, what happened? Well, he died. Okay, well, cool. But, you know, getting into that precog and that basically that proactive aspect where you can see the canaries in the coal mine, from all these disparate data sources, that's a big deal. Excellent points, all excellent points. You got on a roll here. Uh, let's talk uh, priorities. What's important for uh, right now? Uh, let's start with uh, General Brendler. What's uh, what's on your front burner these days? Well, there's <coughs> there's three things I'd like to highlight for probably okay. the coming year or so at okay. least. Uh, Ron mentioned it earlier. I think we got a couple more years through which we're going to need to really work to complete the construction of what we call the Cyber Mission Force. I think secondly, you can expect to see Cybercom uh, really acting on behalf of DOD to participate in the advocacy for cyber legislation mm -hmm. uh, that I think can, can be crafted in a way to provide a framework that really incentivizes the proper behaviors from the private e entities that are most affected by it. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, then, and then third, kind of allowing that to dovetail into what I was hearing Jeff say, uh, because I think that's, you know, along the lines of uh, uh, the work he was describing mm -hmm. with regard to crafting contracts, it's, it's right. the same mentality. Uh, the expansion and improvement of our partnerships. For us at Cybercom, uh, within the military, uh, working within the federal government space in particular, mm -hmm. to partner with folks like DHS, Mm -hmm. and with uh, private industry, for us principally in the sector that constitutes what we consider the defense industrial base. Right. But also recognizing <clears throat> that the Department of Defense wasn't created to defend itself. Uh, we recognize that we have a role in the, uh, uh, in the defense of the nation's interests. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that uh, means that there's a larger public sector Absolutely. responsibility that we're still working with the rest of the federal government to kind of feel our way through. And it's it's necessary for us to work closely with folks like DHS, I think, to, to, yeah. to work Absolutely. that out. Absolutely. Back in my day, we did a, something called Project Matrix where we actually looked at how many other entities are we dependent on in order for our mission to be successful? And it was an eye-opener when you realize yeah. the <laughs> amount of dependencies that you have. So you got to look at that whole, you know, System, system, system. System, system. Yeah, right. <coughs> uh, Ron Punches, what do you think in terms of priorities? Um, so I want to highlight the top three priorities that Lieutenant General Ed Cardone, my boss, is the Command General of Army Cyber Command, is established for fiscal year 15. Okay, terrific. And, and they, they build somewhat on uh, what General Brenler talked about. First is operationalize cyberspace operations for combatant commands and Army commands. And so we're really working through what that really means about integrating cyberspace operations in military operations. We're doing a series of pilots <coughs> at the, really the foundational piece of the Army, the Brigade Combat Team, in concert with our Army's Training and Doctrine Command and Army Forces Command about how do you really integrate it in. And it's really an operational thing, not the traditional sort of the signal or S6 mm -hmm. mission. So how does it mean? The other part we're doing with that is each uh, U.S. Cyber Command assigned each of the, the service cyber components uh, so, uh, responsibilities for certain combatant commands. And so we stood up a joint force headquarters to synchronize the cyber effects for three of the ten combatant commands that U.S. Cyber Command assigned to us. So we're working our way through that process. So that was the top priority. The second one is really further a more defensible network. As we talked earlier, moving to the joint information environment, the joint mm -hmm. regional security stack, be able to have that uh, f from the beginning, uh, th have the secure um, network we're able to defend better. And so that's, that's the priority. And the third one is really organize, equip, and train 
our cyber mission forces. Our contribution to the overall Department of Defense <coughs> is about 1,900 highly trained military and civilian uh, high-end operators to be part of this cyber mission force. Well, certainly heard a lot about the cyber workforce. I'll tell you, it's, um, if I were advising some kids going to college these days, I'd say yeah. take a look at cybersecurity as a future. Um, Jeff, what's, the, what's on your front burner these days? So I'd say everything that Ron said, I'd just maybe I would couch it a little bit different. Uh, one would be uh, the absolute defense in depth, mm -hmm. right? So, so, so actually starting off with the information system, system security officer, he or she comes in in the morning. They have to have the ability to have the complete view of everything that is of concern to them. So ideally, when they come in, they're going to say, hey, these are 10 boxes that weren't here last night. Where the heck did they come from? These are three that are missing. i got to go chase them down. Yeah. Of all the vulnerabilities that I have today, these are my three top that I'm going to prosecute right. to goodness today. I like that. Right. Prosecute to goodness. <laughs> Prosecute right. to goodness. I'm totally I'm using that later. It, 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 oh, we're getting so, great stuff here, man. I'm going to plagiarize all these <laughs> things I'm going to pick up today. So when you get to CDM, <clears throat> right, CDM is also going to be deploying that dashboard that also gives me, as the CISO of DHS, that huge common operating picture for what my environment looks like. Right. So as things like Heartbleed pop up, I can be more responsive, make those key risk decisions based on right now, today, right. I'm ready to roll out a new product. Uh, not a good time, right. right? So these are all things that I think as we begin to get defense in depth, as products like the CDM dashboard get deployed, <clears throat> And the intrusion to defense chain, kill chain, right. if you will, is going to be part and parcel how we survive in the future. Right. Terrific. Well said. Good stuff there. Um, Chris Steele, what do you think? What are, what's on your front burner? You know, our priorities today are really <coughs> moving everybody to more real time. So if you look at our acquisitions over the past few years, what we're concentrating on are products that enable real time decision making. So mm -hmm. as was pointed out earlier, that decision window is closing. Right. And where the industry at whole is moving towards is away from responding to threats and being more proactive. So. What we're looking at doing is providing products that allow you to build real-time analytics on such that you integrate data from a variety of different sources, sure. from security sensors all the way up the application stack into your database, be able to fuse all that data together and make a real-time decision. And when we get to that point where we can really do that, cut that decision-making process down into the, the millisecond range, right. then we can be proactive. We can stop attacks and we can actually become proactive and go after the attacker in real time to, to yeah, not excellent. only thwart the attack, but to go back, turn it around yeah. and attack them. Back to my uh, living in a world where time is approaching zero when it comes to the amount of time to make a decision. Uh, Rick Howard, what do you think? What's, uh, what's on your front burner these days? Well, I, I have a simple one, but it, it needs to be uh, reapproached. After the Snowden revelations, the, the trust between commercial and government sector was damaged a bit. Mm -hmm. So I think the priority on both sides is to rebuild that bridge of trust. Uh, and the way you do it is have these kinds of things where we're talking to each other regularly uh, and a transparency between both groups about what everybody's doing and what we're trying to accomplish. But mm -hmm. I think it has to be a priority. That's going excellent, forward. excellent said. You know, if you want to um, have trustworthy relationships, you have to learn how to trust people. Trust each other. Yeah, and I think you mentioned it earlier, but the information flow between organizations yeah. is critical to that. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, Very good it, point. It, it's what's necessary <clears throat> to establish the shared situational awareness that I think Jeff was referring to. Uh, it makes it possible for the eddies that David was describing to uh, be occurring in a very uh, complex fashion, right. fashion within an organization so that at the very bottom of a hierarchy, uh, someone or something can recognize that it's necessary to take an action in order to proactively uh, uh, adapt to whatever adversaries sure. are doing and provide security. Yeah. David, what do you think? What's, uh, what's, what's on your uh, list of to-dos for tomorrow when you go to work? <laughs> solve world hunger. Um, so, you know, I think that, uh, <laughs> if I could, I would. Um, you know, so I, th I think actually it's, it's, to, it's to dent our own universe before it gets dented for us. I said, you know, so to step in there and enable the sharing of this information, we're talking about the eddies, um, and oftentimes we have looked at it as a hierarchy, and there's some hierarchical aspects, but a lot of times it's heterarchical. It's many-to-many -many environments mm -hmm. that actually have to, you know, share that information in real time. Right. And it's non-trivial. Mm -hmm. So I would say, you know, in that situation is, is we're about not reinventing the wheel, you know, bringing everybody to the table, 
um, you know, Intel as a, as a company is a is is a very you know big you know big we place. embrace everything. So I mean, you know, and what I, what we what we embrace what will move the ecosystem forward in a safe and secure manner. So I think that's a, a big change is that I don't really look at anybody as, as competition in this environment because we're trying to solve a problem that is worldwide and only getting worse right now. So the more information I can bring in real time from uh, from you know Palo Alto, from uh, any of our any of our you know people that is in the industry, the better we're going to be. And I think when you when you look at this, probably one of the best things that I see is DHS and DoD and the federal branches, you know, not reinventing the wheel, you know, and working together right. even more so because <clears throat> the best practices and stuff like that, the best actionable practices for people are going to come out of a lot of these groups. It's going to come out of commercial too, but. These guys get it right. I mean, I, I've had the, uh, the privilege of, um, uh, with Tony Sager, a friend of mine, um, with the NSA when he was there, uh, being able to attack <coughs> the academies in that joint venture, I mean, that right. joint uh, exercise, you know, the, <coughs> and those academies, those guys are sharp. Yeah. And the graduate schools. So I know the talent they're turning out, so I want to leverage that to make the world stronger and safer. Absolutely. Let's get the job done and not worry about who yeah, gets the I, credit I don't, for I don't need done. anybody. I don't, you don't know <coughs> accolades kill us, right? That's right. <laughs> um, I want to talk about challenges. And turn to the future, but uh, first we need to take another short break. You're listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio 1500. The Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. I'm Jim Fizek here with uh, General Brendler from U.S. Cyber Command, Ron Pontius from U.S. Army <coughs> Cyber Command, Jeff Eisensmith from Department of Homeland Security. Rick Howard from Palo Alto Networks, David O'Berry from Intel Security, and Chris Steele from Software AG Government Solutions. We're talking cybersecurity. We've talked uh, quite a bit about progress and programs and lessons and priorities. Let's talk about the hard stuff now, the challenges, the things that we got to get done in order to, you know, really make progress and get where we want to go. Let's start with you again, uh, General Brendler. What are some of the big challenges you think we need to overcome to get where you want to go with these programs? Well, big may actually be an understatement here, but I think two of the really big ones for us, uh, speaking, if I might, for the department really, is the fact that we're trying to grow capability in this cybersecurity area in a time of shrinking budgets. Yeah. And there's a lot of uncertainty about just how much the budgets are shrinking. That's it true. It could be anywhere from Budget Control Act levels to previously proposed budget levels. Mm -hmm. So we kind of have to plan against a range of uncertainties. Yeah, a lot of what and that's, that's very difficult. Yeah. Uh, the second one is, I think today, uh, as a result of historical practices uh, that were the right decisions for folks at the time, we're in a place where, in cybersecurity, uh, the advantage goes to the offense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we need to shift to a point where the advantage goes to the defense. And uh, that's a... That's probably enough to say about that right now. Yeah, that's, that, I, that, that's well said, though. I mean, that's a very, very good point when you think you can get when you think that point down. Uh, Jeff Eisensmith, what were some of the, the tough things, Jeff? Some of the challenges or things you got to overcome to get where you want to go. Well, let me leverage Joe's comment about okay. the advantage goes to the offense today, and and I don't disagree in any way, shape, or form. But I think through the use of methodologies like the intrusion defense chain or the kill chain methodology, defense actually can have an advantage. <coughs> it takes time to get there because what you have to do is each time you get attacked, there'll be seven links in the DHS model. Mm -hmm. If it breaks one, two, three, four, you have to look at what five, six, and seven would have done had the attack gotten to them. And overall, you begin to gather intelligence from every time you get attacked. Right. Right. You cannot control how often you are attacked, but you can control how many links hold in, in those attacks. Mm -hmm. So as we begin to gather things like knowledge management and overlay that into the intrusion defense chain, every time you get attacked, the attacker has to give more and more away. The cost of the attack gets more expensive. Mm -hmm. And when you add that to things like the cyber weather map, which is coming out of MPPD and Phyllis Schneck, mm -hmm. You can put those attack vectors into signatures, put them into E3, and then deploy them across the fabric of the government and the commercial sector if they volunteer. So attack once, everyone gets inoculated quickly. That's a paradigm going forward which we have to pursue. Right. Uh, very good. Uh, Ron Pontius, what do you think uh, some of the challenges, the big I challenges? I want to highlight two. Okay. And, and even though the <clears throat> Army leadership and you could say Congress has been very supportive of what were the uh, cybers are very high priority in the Army, 
the really fiscal environment that General Brendler talked to. It's the sequestration and the unpredictable funding year to year that is making the the Army be, how does the Army commit to the uh, training readiness of its entire force. And cyber is just a microcosm of that larger mm -hmm. fiscal environment that's really challenging. The other one is it really needs to be across the entire Army and the Department of Defense that we do routine things well. And that's beyond just the cyber folks. It's everybody. Configuration management, patch management, not clicking on the things that you shouldn't click on with the phishing and right. those sort of things. Right. You know, what we call cyber hygiene, right? right? That, whole, that whole thing about we have to train the entire workforce about routine things because every, every person is, has to be a contributor to the success of, again, our capabilities, which this really is a national security. That really is a good point, too. I mean, you're relying on every individual that's touching that network has a responsibility in the cyber world, cyber hygiene, as you put it. Uh, as we always do, we like to talk about the future and where this is all going. When I, get the, when I get a bunch of smart people together like this, I like to get some projections of what it's going to look like out there. Let's start with David O'Berry. David, what do, you, what do you see in the future? Where is this all going? Are we going to get to the point where we're actually in front of this stuff? I mean, it seems to me that every day I read the paper and someone's getting hacked I mean, are we going to get to a point where we're, we're not going to have to be worried about this stuff? Well, to, I, to the I don't know if we'll ever get to the point where we don't have to worry about it necessarily. I think actually what it will be is becomes part of the consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. As ubiquitous computing and Internet of Things and the fact that you're wearing a Fitbit and three other devices and they're all communicating, you're your own, you know, micro cloud at that right. point in time, right? So nobody wants to put their refrigerator on the Internet and have 20,000 gallons of milk ordered from Walmart. I promise you, you know, that when that happens, people... You get in my house, I can never have enough milk. <laughs> That's it, right? I'm a 13-year-old. I'm right there with you. Um, so, so, but I think what we're, when you really start to think about this, um, what, what we've been talking about is the cyber hygiene aspect, the block and tackle aspect. But the reason you do that is to give yourself that much more time, that much more energy... Um, when you don't reinvent the wheel, right? You just do these things to, to really tackle the hard aspects of things. I think longer term, we're talking about the cyber workforce and things like that. But really, you know, our gen my kids, my child's generation, my 13-year-old and on down, this is a cyber generation, right? Yeah, absolutely. So this is a generational aspect. And actually, they may actually be the ones that save us all before it's over with. But we've got to give them the platform. So I think whether you're part of the, you know, you're uh, uh, serving in the Army or you're working for Intel or Software AG, you're a digital citizen, yeah. I think. And that training <clears throat> aspect needs to be threaded within what you do. Um, the, the entire immersion within that and the secure aspects of that come along with, with those situations. But if you can enable that information sharing at the top down right now while we're trying to get over this gap, I think we will get in front of it, um, but it's going to have to take, uh, you know, it's going to, like you said, like, like you said, Jim, said right. it's going to have to take enabling that group of people to participate in their own survival. I always say humanity will participate in its own survival if given the chance. Excellent. We've Excellent. got to give them the tools to do that. All right. I like that. I like that a lot. Chris Steele, what's your crystal ball look like? Where's this all gone? <laughs> so David brought up a really good point, and that is about uh, refrigerators. Uh, Fifteen years ago at Sun, McNeely was talking about uh, networking your toaster, and now we are fast approaching that point where everything is going to be networked. Uh, the, the Internet of Things is growing exponentially, and that's uh, increasing our attack surface exponentially. And I agree with David. I don't think cybersecurity is something that we're ever not going to have to worry about. I think that we are going to continue to uh, bake that into our consciousness, and we're going to continue to build better tool sets for addressing it. So having the ability to um, fuse data from uh, multiple thousands of different devices and sensors, be able to analyze it in real time, uh, bring new technologies uh, like predictive analytics to bear to mm -hmm. be able to really get ahead of the attacks and be able to stop them. And I do truly believe that one day we will get to the point where we don't have these major breaches. I think we'll always have a lot of different point type attacks. Sure. Um, and that will just be an ongoing battle that we're going to continue Good. to fight. It's so we, we won't have digital Pearl Harbor, but uh, we will continue to have people uh, in gnats clawing at our ankles and things like that. Ron Pontius, what do you think? What's it look like down the road for you? So as, you, as we've talked <coughs> already, the, the, our reliance on the capabilities that we have is, is critically important. At the same time, the barrier to entry for the <coughs> bad actors is 
easy, it's easier and easier to, to, to be to do things and do harm to sure. us. Sure. And so part of this is the whole discussion. It really is about, I think, the area that we're probably the least mature is what we're calling defensive cyberspace operations. And that's much more than just the defending the network. But it's, it's actually actively going at um, those pursuing those who are the bad actors that are, that are trying to do us harm. So that, that overall balance there of defensive cyberspace operations. We really have to make it more costly and time, cons costly and time consuming for the bad actors. Mm -hmm. um, so like some thoughts, you know, classic deterrence theory is based on the concepts of threat and cost. We either need to have the fear of reprisal or the belief that an attack is too hard or too expensive. Mm -hmm. That's part of how we've got to change this dynamic moving forward. Very good, very good. Make it, make it difficult and make it painful. Uh, Rick Howard, where's this all going in the future? So I'm optimistic, okay? Uh, we, uh, we're at a tipping point right now where I think all the innovative ideas that we've talked about at this panel today, we're talking about kill chain analysis and building intelligence teams and having the right people and the right platform to do that, that technology is here today. Yeah. Right, and it's easier and easier for the have-nots to have that and to have all those advanced ideas yes. working in their network. Right, so I'm very optimistic, very excited that uh, we can help provide that kind of thing. Perfect, I love it. I love it. Uh, Jeff Eisensmith, what's it look like for you, Jeff? Where's this all going? All right, what's so the future look like? Buzz kill here. Oh, uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it wouldn't be a good panel if everyone just agreed with everybody. It's always right. one of those. So the, so the Internet of Things is the one thing that really <clears throat> has me concerned. I mean, it, you just can't be concerned enough about it. So people say, say you, know, well, you know, I'm not that frightened of my refrigerator. Yes, you are. I'm not that frightened of my toaster. But think about your car. How many computers, full-blown computers, are in your car? How many people with new cars mm -hmm. plug their phone into their car? Mm -hmm. Good some, God. Somebody once told me that some of the strategic plans of the auto industry, they see making more money on the automation in the car in the future yeah. than they'll make on the car itself. So, so, and I, I will tell you that when you get into a car today, it's fly-by-wire. When you push their brake pedal, you're, you're not actually pushing the brakes. And there are collision avoidance now, so they can turn the wheel for you to avoid getting into a crash. Think about if somebody hacked your car. Think if they hacked a thousand cars. Right. And told half the cars to go really fast and half the cars to lock up their brakes. This, oh, for, for thought, we, we, we really need to get in front of this. Yeah. And, and the natural forces are against this because time to market means you get out there quickly and the cost point says you don't put more into it than you absolutely have to. So when things get deployed, it's hard to get them patched and updated because they're not designed for that. And they may not even have the memory space available to accept the patch they need as unforeseen threats develop. Yeah, so good, the very good point. There's a lot of opportunity there to provide that security. Yeah. We, have to, we have to get that foundation right right now. So. Yeah, a lot of good points there. I mean, there's an argument that says that to date, Attacks have been expensive annoyances, but really not life-threatening. But some of the things you're talking about can take it to a whole nother level and to, to where we're talking life-threatening. Um, <clears throat> General Brendler, what's it look like in the future? Where's this all going in your crystal ball? Well, I said earlier I'm not an absolutist. I, I am sort of an optimist, like Rick said, and I think probably for similar reasons. Uh, I, I think we can get to the point where we're actually exemplifying a proactive prevention of a lot of the problems. But in order to do that, we have to wrestle with the problem that Jeff was just describing. It's very complex. I think we're at the tipping point, not just from a technical perspective, the availability of technologies that can be applied, but also human recognition of what it is that we're dealing with. Mm -hmm. I think it, we're, we're at a tipping point where people will recognize for the very scenarios that you gave, that it's of personal interest to them to understand what is at risk and what is necessary in order to fix it. So getting through that with the momentum that comes from that interest, I think we'll get to the point where we can shift the advantage to the defense. I like that. I like that. Isn't it always said that the good defense is what wins the Super Bowls? Uh, Dave, <laughs> you got one comment before I wrap up here? Absolutely. I, I, think, I think in the end what we're looking at and talking about are we ever going to have to not be concerned 
I, it's going to be part of the consciousness. So I think it's the rapid evolution of, of cyber resilience and mitigation that, that you can contain it within, like you said, that it's not going to just blow up like it is. Right. But a lot of times we built for avoidance, and avoidance just doesn't make any sense. The, right now, it's the mitigation and resilience of that. Uh, of those threats. Right. So. Very well said. Let me uh, do take a shot here, like I always do, uh, trying to do some summary of what we talked about here. Um, what I heard <coughs> in the area of progress is a lot of, about the cyber force and the need to develop that cyber force and how important that's going to be. I heard about prioritization. I heard about focusing on apps and data and not just the perimeter. I heard about information sharing being a, a critical element of this. Um, uh, the CDM program was uh, identified as one uh, spe specific program. We talked about the joint information environment in the DOD world of being a, another priority program that uh, needs needs attention and is getting uh, moving forward. Uh, a lot of lessons learned. Um, I heard it's a national issue. I think we all recognize that. No, no one entity is going to solve this. Um, I heard no complacency. We got to stay in front of the attacks because the bad guys out there are always looking for a new way in. <coughs> we talked about risk versus just cybersecurity. Talk about the risk aspect of this thing as a way to articulate and talk to senior leadership. We talked about moving from just responding to more of an intelligence piece to try to get in front of some of the, the things going on. And we heard the importance of baking security in at the start rather than trying to retrofit it uh, after the fact. Priorities, uh, I heard uh, cyber <coughs> uh, command, I heard about legislation. Now that we've got pr uh, cyber security is a priority, here's a good opportunity to try to get some legislation done. I heard uh, the term operationalize, which I like, meaning uh, let's not worry about checking blocks on paper to say we're doing this. Let's actually do things. Uh, de defense in depth came up, uh, real time decision making. Challenges, budgets are always out there and going to be a challenge. Um, we know that. Um, and, uh, and we heard about the cyber hygiene idea that it's everybody has to be part of this, right on down to every individual that's touching that network or has some, some way to uh, access uh, uh, the, the infrastructure. The future, we talked about the Internet of Things pr proposing some new challenges. Um, I'm, I'm now nervous about my refrigerator and my toaster. Uh, <laughs> But um, in, my the, in my car, which is now going to be, uh, you know, <coughs> doing, driving yeah, driving itself and taking me out where I maybe didn't want to go. But we did, I think, I did hear also that uh, we do see ourselves for getting much more proactive than we've ever been in the past. We're not just band-aiding the problems every time they show up. We're trying to get smarter and get out in front and prevent the problems from happening. With that, I want to switch and first thank all our panelists for being here um, to get uh, people of your level and, and your expertise in this area together is uh, always an honor for me. I feel like you help, help keep me smart. I mean, so appreciate you taking the busy time from your schedules to be here. Thanks to our sponsors uh, for the show, without which we don't have a show, so we appreciate uh, the sponsorship. Thanks to the good people here at Federal News Radio who do such a uh, good job in, uh, uh, with us. And most importantly, Thanks to our listening audience out there that tune into the show. Uh, we appreciate uh, the time and efforts that you make there. With that, uh, that will conclude our show. You've been listening to the Federal Executive Forum on Federal News Radio, 1500 AM.